Welcome. This is the Punk CX Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsco, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, Forbes contributor, and general explorer of the service and experience space. On the podcast, I seek out and interview entrepreneurs, leading business people, authors, tech leaders, academics, and generally cool people doing interesting stuff in the service and experience space. Check out the archive at adrianswinsco.com. That's enough from me. Let's get into the interview. Now, before we get into the interview, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to the folks at HubSpot for sponsoring my podcast this month. Now, HubSpot have built an AI-powered customer platform with all the software, integrations, and resources that you need to connect your marketing, sales, and service. It's all very, very cool. So do check them out at HubSpot.com. And also, thank you to them for sponsoring my podcast this month. So now that you know that, let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX Podcast. With me today, I have Gopi Polavarapu, who is the Chief Solutions Officer at Core.ai. Or is it Core AI? I'm not sure. He'll probably tell us in, the, in, in a moment. But Gopi, welcome to the podcast. I hope I got the name of the company right. But more importantly, I hope I pronounced your surname right as well. You got both right. So thanks for having me. So uh, just to give a little bit about me. So my name is Gopi Polavarapu. So I've been in the... AI space for about the last 10 years and the software and telecommunication space for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I joined Core uh, about two years ago when Core has been announced as the market leader in conversational AI platform. This is pre-opening AI days, you know, mm-hmm. chat GPT. So Core has been in the business for about uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, they've been building conversational AI platforms, primarily playing in the CX space, helping contact centers, helping agents, and that is what the company's DNA has been. And then since the uh, generative AI and open AI hit us with ChatGPT, so we have seen a huge rise in the adoption of the technology. People are seeing it, uh, you know, with a different lens compared to the chatbot 1.0 where people have failed using chatbots. Now they're seeing it a different lens with generative AI. So a company is about uh, 1,000 people uh, as, as a company. So we've been listed as uh, market leaders by Forrester Gartner, pretty much every analyst in the marketplace. And what I do at Core is uh, we actually take our platforms for build. We have three platforms. One is the conversational AI platform, the search AI platform, and the generative AI platform. So my team goes and identifies the problems for industries, for example, retail. Mm-hmm. What are the problems for retailers that are common across so that? How do I build the right language models for those things, right NLUs, right ASRs and TTS for those industries so that Companies can build solutions, whether it's contact center or there's a pre-sale use cases. So we're allowing them to build these use cases by pre-training the data for those particular use cases. For example, right. in a retail industry, what do people do? They go to a website to return an order. They want to buy something. They want to do a discovery of a product. The so things that are relevant for every retailer is the common thing. And that is why you have platforms like Shopify, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, SAP Fury. So these platforms enable these commerce platforms and all we come in is how do we enable those guys from both from a customer service perspective as well as from a chatbot from a digital teams perspective. So we're enabling both the teams. So that's one vertical. So we also do the same thing in healthcare when it comes to patient, you know, uh, provider, payer, and licenses. And when you go to banking, we do conversational banking. Like Bank of America talks about Erica, which is their conversational banking. How do I use my Alexa to transfer money, as an example? Mm-hmm. So we're enabling those things for other banks. And as we expand further, we have now telecom customers, we have high-tech companies. We're about eight different verticals that we play in. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes to the using this technology for in-house, when it comes to employee engagement, so we're also looking at HR automation, IT automation, procurement automation with agents and chatbots available within the team's channels, which employees use for their communication, and then connect back with their functional leaders to help them, whether it's a benefits use case, whether this is helping them with the RFP process. So we're seeing a wide variety of use cases by enabling internal employees, not just agents, but going after EX space, not just AX space. And that is what my team does in building those scalable, repeatable things, which are pre-configured, 
the model is trained to understand those, you know, uh, 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 taxonomy, autonomy, so that way we know how these things are built and we're able to comprehend so that we're getting the solution up to 80, 90 percent. And then the next 20, 10 percent is basically what the customer does with our partners and they customize it and tweak it to their needs. So that's what my team does. Fantastic. It's interesting for me on, on kind of like um, both parts is one is that what to get a chance to speak to a technology kind of leader in this place, not just like a leader, an individual, but also kind of a leader as a, that is a brand in this place that is, that is top right. And this has yep. been sustainably top right. But also over the, over the last five years, I've been do, putting together these, uh, a series of predictions that I publish on, on Forbes kind of every year. And interestingly enough, one of the actual predictions this year that I, that, that I curated out of all the submissions I got was that the emergence of, um, industry and function specific kind of models that would actually start to improve some of the the outcomes of that that's and and refine some of the outcomes and the possibilities that, that coming from some of these much much larger kind of the the mega llms as it, as it were so that's really kind of interesting um so it's a it's a real kind of like I, i'm really looking forward to our discussion but they we're not going to talk about that because we're not, not going to noodle around the rest the, on, the, on the technology we're going to sort of zoom out a little bit because the thing that i noticed was that recently you published two different reports and what was interestingly uh, interesting to me about them is that it's almost like two sides of the same coin in many ways there was that you you did the um, you published a report called the agent experience benchmark report and also the customer experience benchmark report and so i wanted to ask you a little bit about the reports and but before i kind of dig into a couple of things and that that stood out to me specifically in the reports i wonder if you give me tell me a little bit about the reports why you published them and what are some of the headlines coming out of each of the reports to give us a bit of a flavor as it were Sure. As I said, the company started with the foundation of helping agents and uh, CX and the customer experience, uh, family in the contact center. So obviously this is a bread and butter business. So we work with pretty much uh, uh, the top 500 fortune, you know, of the top 2000, we're working with the top 400 of them. So what we're learning when we talk to these agents is the, the repetitiveness, you know, of doing the task that has the screen fatigue, as an example, from a mm -hmm. tech perspective. When a customer calls in, you and I expect them to know we already spoke to your bar, we already gave our name, we already give you the details. And you, when the call gets routed to the agent, they ask the same question, which is pretty mm -hmm. annoying mm -hmm. as a customer. So it's the same thing applies to the agent. It's pretty annoying to them. Why the hell I don't know all these details? When a customer's coming to me, why do you have to ask them questions? Because it's wasting their time so that if somebody can give that data to them, it reduces their call handling time, which is mm -hmm. how the metric that they track them out, right? So if the agents are given metrics to reduce their handling time, so they need the technology to help them. So as we wanted to understand, is the agents worried about AI, that AI is going to eat their jobs, or are they actually using this technology to help them better do their job, right? And that is the essence of what we have done from a research perspective. And what we learned when we did was, obviously, they're more interested in tech so that I don't have a screen fatigue by the end of the day. I have a better work-life balance when it comes to the work-life balance. I'm able to help more customers faster, sooner, rather than me going to one screen to the other to the other to accomplish what the customer is asking for. So which is why they're looking for better technology because, obviously, twofold. One is... It's ease of work and work-life balance. The second is the Zen Z workforce is joining the contact centers. And these are the generation that actually grew up with uh, series with their hand. I mean, that's how they did their whole ones. Now, that's how they, they answered everything in life. So they can't see this technology. So that's why companies have to actually adopt these things. Otherwise, the next generation of workforce won't see you as a feasible company to work for because you're really backward in terms of doing things the way you do. So okay. that's why tech you know, is obviously more important, not just the pay for them, because that way they, they can both these things we're talking about. The second one we're looking at about is uh, a lot of these contact centers are behind. I mean, we're talking to some of the biggest brands, but they still ask you when the call gets out to a, a human, they ask you the same questions, like very basic things, like who are you, what are you calling for, what's your case number? You should know by my phone number, all those things. Mm -hmm. And customers are giving the data to you and you're collecting my data, but you're not actually using the data, which is where we feel the contact centers are behind when it comes to tech adoption. 
So yeah. then the third third major one that we're looking at is obviously the education of AI to do a better job satisfaction. Uh, as an example, how can you use AI to trade? So that so we have a tool called Agent AI, which actually helps them to check box and then hey, I will check the customer are they happy with this service. I will check with the customer have they done this particular task. It's almost like a task tracker. And based on what the customer says, if a customer says, I'm pretty annoyed with your service, then there is a follow-up series of questions that we should be asking. So that AI is actually hearing your conversation or you know, talking to you or chatting with them. It's actually reading those conversations and able to give you what is the next best thing you should do to help this customer. So okay. this is where AI helps them in educating them about their own product. Because imagine if you're working on Walmart or Home Depot, you have a million skills. It's mm-hmm. impossible. You don't know everything about everything. So, and that is where AI can come in and help them with education on how do you handle these scenarios. And they're sounding more knowledgeable than, oh, let me find you an expert that knows this thing. You are making everybody an expert in a contact center. Excellent. So, so there's a couple of things that I wanted to, based on what you were saying, but also kind of my, when I re- reviewed the reports, there's a couple of things I wanted to dig into from in each report, just to give people a kind of a bit of a flavor, but also just to explore the findings. Because fun, some of the findings I found uh, different, let's say. And particularly at the AX report, I mean, and you alluded to it in just w- in what you were saying previously, because this there's a the finding. One of the findings was that customers it says customer service agents across the globe now see automated agent assist technology as more important than a competitive salary or hourly wage. And I was a bit like, really? And because I was it was a surprising one, and so. Can you tell me a little bit kind of like more about that? Because it's the, I think the, the, the thing that strikes me with that, because actually some of the contact center spaces have always struggled with paying competitive rewards. That's right. And that's, and that's largely because of their, you know, a number of different reasons. One, because of their, their, their headcount is large, is a large, very, very large percentage of their operating kind of cost. So it's an expensive operation. But also the the way that the work's been kind of like seen and treated and so on and, and and so forth. But I know that is changing in many places. But I wanted to really understand this because it feels like the, the balance has tipped or it's tipping, as it were. So to, can you tell me about what's the some of the, what's the underlying driver of this change? Is this just like oh, I'm okay with a salary because it looks like it's going to be made easier, or what's going on here? Okay. Yeah, no, I think the the no one's gonna get a pay cut, right? So no one's gonna like a pay cut. Hey, mm-hmm. uh, give me a tech, you know, I'm gonna get, take a pay cut. So no one's gonna say that. The the underlying point here is, can the tech help me do more? That is right. the question. Okay. Right? So, and this is all about if you look at any contact center, the KPIs that contact center track are the two things: how many calls you're getting, what is your average handling time. These are the two metrics that the contact center you do case about. So that I can reducing the amount of calls. So one, obviously, you're spending less on, on technology from a, from a call routing perspective, you know, voice, telephony perspective, infrastructure perspective, as the call handling comes down. But the other thing is, as a contact center agent, I'm able to handle more calls per day. Earlier, I used to handle, like, let's say, you know, five, 12 calls a day, depending upon you know who you're talking about. Assuming it's a five-minute call. So then in an eight-hour eight hour shift, you're looking at somewhere around, you know, 70, 80 calls, right? So 96 calls, sorry. So if the tech comes in and helps them to reduce that average handling time from five minutes to three minutes, for example, summarization, can it take a minute, right? Can mm-hmm. AI come and do the summarization of the case for me? Then I don't need to do the repetitive thing. I am going to go to my next call, the next call. So slowly what will happen in this space is it's almost like paper performance type thing. Right. Where people People are getting into that more, hey, I want to pay you per call, is the discussion that's happening in contact center when people talk about offshore call center. Because the way I'm saying it confidently is, if you look at the low end of the spectrum in contact center, like pizza ordering, mm-hmm. where there are contact centers, we call the pizza store, the call's going to Philippines, somebody's actually taking an order there for you. Mm-hmm. And those guys are getting paid per call. They don't get all on the callings. So right. they want to now wrap up that call as soon as possible using tech, so they get paid more. So th- this is not about taking a pay card. This is about doing more with less in time and then able to get more as a compensation based on the performance that they're delivering using tech. 
I see. I see. Well, now that makes more sense because you're being able to help them the, and the throughput. And it's what we would call, uh, well, uh, traditionally in, in the UK, what we would call it, it's like it's a piece rate type thing. That's kind of what it called. It's called historically. My, I remember my mum used to do work that she used to do kind of like sewing type work for people and it, she'd get paid per garment that she would that, that she would sew when she was working part time when she was uh, when we were young. And so, you know, I, I completely understand that that makes much, much more sense when you kind of like pit that whole salary versus the technology sort of thing. Right. But the also the other kind of thing, uh, so thank you for clarifying that. The um, then the other thing I, I thought was interesting, and I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about because you alluded to the idea one of the biggest frustrations for customers and also agents, and I've seen research that mirrors this, is it's like having to repeat yourself. Right or having to ask somebody to repeat it, so like it's out there. That's like irrefutable number one on both sides. Yeah. But what are the other? What's the other underlying um, frustrating experiences for agents? What are the? What's top of mind for them uh, right now from your research? So obviously the knowledge gap is the big one, right? So you have departments that actually do certain things. They call specialists themselves, right? Right. So with the technology, the way it is right now, it's kind of democratizing everybody as experts. So, I mean, whoever has Siri knows everything in the world knowledge. You know, you don't need to be a, you know, who wants to be a millionaire to be the smartest person, right? So you have a Siri, you can answer every question. So same thing applies when you go to the contact center. You know everything about your products. You know everything about your business. You know everything about your processes, right? Somebody wants, I need to return, but looks like my package that broke and what's like, how do I claim an insurance? Instead of me trying to find who can help them, the AI is helping you help them and make right. you an expert. So which is the first thing, which is the making everybody at the same level as everyone, okay. using AI. Then the second value is, hey, how do I perform better when it comes to customer experience? A customer is calling you, yelling at you, screaming at you, they're pissed off, and you have a sentiment analysis you do, then how do you put that sentiment that you're doing in a proactive way, then a reactive looking at numbers of customers are upset, how do you actually solve that problem? So when, when a customer uses the cusp words in a lot of the conversations we hear, then the bot automatically naturally picks up, hey, we seriously apologize, you know. It comes up with the language that you would be shocked, like, hey, I would have said it. Even what happens is when a customer is activated, the other person related it. So the little board we live in, they get activated. So how do you keep yourself calm by looking at what the AI is telling you and start following that instructions that helps them stay calm, stay composed so that your CSAT goes up, right? You are now, all of a sudden, you're not pissing them off, you know, uh, you're actually helping them with what they're asking for and apologizing if the things went wrong and trying to create a brand that we need to create. We call it a human experience and, mm -hmm. and things go bad, that is an opportunity for you to really make it and turn it around and create that customer for life by solving their pain point and responding them, even if it's giving them something in return. And that is what typically SaaS companies are good at. You can Netflix, or you look at Amazon Prime, and they're excelling that where they don't really care about the cost and the benefit of that particular transaction, but they're looking at the overall customer life cycle and what is the total uh, you know, lifetime value of this customer and help them do it to create the human experience of that brand. So that is what I see is, it's not just making democratizing the tech and the knowledge of the business, but the second thing is how you actually interpersonally communicate in that human and then solving this pain point to create the brand that you want to create. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, that's side It's basically trying to, it's, it's very contextual stuff, right? It's almost a bit like, give me the tools and the skills and the capabilities and the support in order to help me in the moment. In the, right. in, okay. and, and yeah, because that's, that's very much aligned to something I've been thinking about talking about for like a while now is like you know particularly when you get into a live channel and you get beyond the whole self-service sort of thing and if somebody has tried a customer has tried to go through that journey and not been successful it's only reasonable to expect that the customer is going to arrive in that live channel with heightened expectations right because they've exerted all that effort and therefore the pressure then is on the brand to enable, well, basically to operationalize excellence in the moment. And, right. and all it's basically kind of trying to help your kind of agents be the rock stars that they're capable of being kind of in the moment. That's right. Yeah, no, I think the brands have to enable agents because at the end of the day, the chatbots 1.0 failed to achieve the problem. 
right? Mm-hmm. The problem is the customer is not looking to talk to a heat or a, or a ball. They just want an answer to their question. Mm-hmm. And whoever provides it faster is the route they take. Yeah, absolutely. So I can talk to a bot and get the answer in 30 seconds. And I can wait in the line for two minutes to talk to a human. If the bot can answer what I'm looking for, I don't mind getting answered from a bot. But the way the tech is going, you will not see the difference whether it's a human answering or the bot answering too, right? So there is not much of difference anymore with the generative AI. Because generative AI is able to personalize things. It's able to create content. So it is enabling brands to pick the journey. But in order to get there, you need data. And the data will only come by enabling the agents. Yeah. And so the, I mean, that's a nice kind of like segue. So, and I'll, I want to come back to the, um, the indistinguishable nature of whether it's a human or, 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 or tech. But, but I'll come back to that a bit later. But I want to go to the, 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 the CX report that you did. And one particular finding that was in there, which sort of speaks to, I think, what you were talking about before, which was this idea that the, there's a finding that says the ability to connect with a live person at will is no longer the singularly most crucial aspect of a self-guided customer service journey. And I wanted to ask you, maybe it's just asking you to repeat yourself, I, we will see. I mean, is that because you think customers are just getting more used to self-service and automated channels, or is it that they're, those services are getting better? Or is it a combination of the two? Yeah, I mean, it's the timing thing, like I was saying, you know, I'm probably will repeat the same thing I said earlier, which is customers want answers faster quickly. That's mm-hmm. what and they want the problem solved quickly. Whichever way it works, they don't really care. And as the Zen Z workforce come in, this is a generation that always chats. They, they don't really like to talk to humans. And that is the generation I'm mean, I have my teenage daughter that she texts me from upstairs rather than coming down and talking to me. So that, <laughs> that is the generation that we're, we're seeing in the, in the customer base now. So that's, that's the transition of what's happening. But for a, when it comes to a brand, it really doesn't matter whether you're providing a tech to solve the problem or humans to support the problem. So from a customer perspective, they need answers faster. So Hey, can you put so many people to handle their calls faster? Take an example of airlines, right? Mm-hmm. Airlines' typical handling time is 10 minutes. I mean, I'm giving you the best airlines, 10 minutes handling time. Mm-hmm. And that is their handling time. And the old times could range, I mean, obviously, during COVID time, they were like eight hour folding times. But post COVID, when they staffed up the people, end of the day, you need to staff up people. It's a business ROI decision for you to have live agents. So it is. Either or, right? It's kind of somewhere in between a gray, right? It's so not like the black and white. I can say, oh, I can go with the chatbot. Like Frontier said, hey, it's chatbot only, no agents, no voice. Just go there, use my bot and get the answers. But obviously, customer is upset because they're not getting what they need. And you may route everyone to a live agent and a live agent can answer those questions. Then you're looking at a cost factor mm-hmm. that you cannot afford that thing. So the answer lies somewhere in between where you are using mix of these technologies where some use cases are very easy to solve using a bot, which is all about order status. You can retail, right? You don't want to talk to a human to find out what is my order status and rescheduling a delivery appointment. So things that are much easier to solve using a bot can be done using a bot. And things that are much complex, like, hey, I, I, I received the product. It's broken. I need to file an insurance claim. And that's a, that's a process that you need to know. And it's not anywhere there. So it requires some high-touch engagement with the agent, which is where you need to have an agent. So that's why the branch and the customers are really not looking at black and white. They're looking somewhere in between so that when I need a human, I need a human. Uh, when you can solve my problem with the tech, I don't mind using the tech. Right. And I want to come, circle back to something quickly that you can have said about the whether it's a bot or a human and the technology is on a... I feel like a maturity curve that, that you'll, it'll be indistinguishable, then indistinguishable between the two. Now, here's a question. It's like, do you think, I mean, what's your view on, should brands distinguish themselves between you're now talking to a bot and now you're talking to a human? Or is it, do you just leave it and is it it's blurred lines? Or is that, is that a something which is a brand specific kind of question? But what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Because sometimes people, you, know, you could be talking to a great bot and get some great outcomes, and you could be talking to an ill-equipped, fully trained 
sort of like a human being and not get sort of the, the great outcomes. And then, but we'd still feel differently about whether it's a piece of technology or it's a human being. Yeah. I mean, we have seen industries, some industries, for example, hospitality space, right? They don't want their customers to know they're talking to a bot. Right. Okay. Right. So we have talked to a uh, hotel. I mean, this is a big casino. And the, one of the biggest tasks is ability to understand what people are talking and they should not even know that they're talking to a bot. It's, it's their experience because you're paying a premium price to come to a hotel and you pick up the phone and call a friend desk. You don't want a bot to talk to you, right? You want a human to talk to you. So it depends on the industry that they're in. But if when it speaks to healthcare, in healthcare, I want to make an appointment with a doctor and you better talk to a nurse, not to a bot. Right. And this is expectation from the, from the customer, right? So they don't mind talking to some bot or a retail order status. It's not like, you know, life-threatening type situation, right? So you can talk to a bot. But when it comes to a use case that I talked about in healthcare, and I file the claim, I'm not getting my payment. What should I do? Mm -hmm. I hate to talk to a bot because the customer frustration levels have gone up right. uh, with the problem, right? So now they don't have the patience to talk to a bot and they want to talk to a human to solve their problem because they think they can influence the human with their persuasion, right? It's a human thing, right? So right. I can quit people by talking to them. It's stupid bots are going to allow, not allow me to do what I need to do. So they'll, they'll be persistent in getting to an area. Imagine you lost, you missed your plane. Yeah. You're not to a bar. I want to talk to a human to get me on the next plane because I need to make my, my holiday vacation. So examples vary, use cases vary, and human behaviors vary, right? So all these three things come in on what is the priority. It just purely depends on the situation that, that a customer is in. Perfect. No, it's, no, it's great. There's, <clears throat> I think it's an interesting kind of uh, question, and, how, and, and I wanted to explore that. Because you kind of like you, you kind of spoke into it because it's like I think it's a a dynamic that people have to consider, um, and how you approach it will 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 differ according to your you know to your industry to the situation to your brand all these different sort of things and also what yeah. your how, what how you know the, what your customers will you know will prefer. Um, so the the last thing I want to ask you about on the um on the CX report, it, only because I myself am a Gen Xer and the report refers to Gen Xers as being curmudgeonly. Now, I know that I'm in, I've got increasingly kind of like kind of white hair and I'm increasingly curmudgeonly as I get, I get a little bit older, but I wanted to understand for all the Gen Xers that are listening kind of out there, it's like, why do you refer to Gen Xers as curmudgeonly? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Any generation that is in the persona today, in the demographic, right? The the eldest one always gets blamed, right? So these are that is a common thing. I used to call baby boomers, right? So I'm kind of the edge of the Gen X and the early of uh, early of millennials, right? right? So we always used to call all oh, baby boomers. You know, they always want to talk to people. They don't want to use any tech. You know, not tech savvy. So now that baby boomers have kind of, uh, you know, retired in the retirement stage right now. So it's the term, term of Zen, Zen uh, X people to be treated that, right? So, and that is why, uh, you know, uh, the tag that you're seeing is there because this is a generation that actually was seeing the dot-com evolution and mm -hmm. they in pre-dot-com and post-dot-com. So it's quite possible that there are some people that are not as tech savvy as others. I mean, people in tech, tech industry, they were adopted, but people that are not in the tech industry, in the Zen, you know, especially the, uh, the, the this generation that we're talking about, it's really hard for them to completely transition to tech. So they're kind of in between people, whereas millennials are completely using tech and uh, Zen Z is automatically in, in tech. But this is a generation where you have a mix of people. They're like kind right. of the baby boomers and kind of millennials in between. So depending upon which part of Zen X you are in, like, I'm actually on the later side. I'm more towards the tech side. I don't like to talk to humans. I just want to get my things done. I would rather text you and you text me when you're done. I don't want to wait on phone to uh, get an answer for you unless I need to talk to you because I'm expect late. My next flight is like next five minutes. I need to talk to human. Then I obviously will go on live chat or talk to them. Uh, but I will not prefer to talk to them because I'm an edge of the Zen X, right? But if you're in the other spectrum, so obviously... Uh, they're looking at saying, okay, I want to talk to human because that's how I feel I can persuade them because that's how you've seen as an experience. That is why we kind of tag them as that. Well, okay. I'll, I won't take it personally then. 
That's fine. Yeah, nothing <laughs> because I don't. Think <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought it was funny because I looked at it and was like, what? I'm like going, hmm, what do they know? Have they been watching me? Yes, I am getting a bit more curmudgeonly. But no, no, I, I completely, I, I get that. Thank you for clarifying you know, that. But so, like, if we zoom out again, I mean, you've got these two reports. You've got the CX1 and you've got the AX1. I mean, what do you think are some of the biggest lessons coming out of the report? Or, or maybe you also make, do it this way. What sort of recommendations would you make to brands that are kind of listening in about the kind of findings? What sort of things do you think? Yeah, okay, these are the, these are the, the, the top messages. Yeah, I think the, the, it's the time to action type thing, right? So you need to take an action. If you're running a contact center now, how do you help your agents get better? How are you actually driving to get more workforce to come to you as the Gen Z comes in? Because Gen Z is all about instant gratification generation, right? If you're an Uber driver, you have seen that you're gratified immediately with palms. Mm -hmm. So they know how you perform and you know how much you got paid. And that is the generation that they're in. And they won't be interested in doing repetitive work, repetitive things. They're more interested in this kind of instant gratification. I got my commission. I got my performance rating. I got my CSAT coach. This is what the generation is. And when we talk to them, they all talk about how do I actually build my own uh, career, uh, driving, delivering goods, or doing things in a gig economy. Contact center needs to evolve to create the next gig economy type experiences for Gen Z to come in. And it will come with obviously the tech that they need so that they can achieve things faster and they're able to do your CSATs because they're now much faster because they're not compensated just by, by eight hour share, but they're really looking at how do I solve more problems faster so that they're getting paid more, just like the, the Uber driver from the, on the last month delivery, you know, mm -hmm. no desk. So that is what the next generation is looking from from a work perspective. So you need to enable your workforce for that next generation to have all the tech in place for agents. But if you're a digital team that's looking at customer service and how do I create some kind of a semi-autonomous way where I'm using some use cases that are non-critical for a customer, how do I automate those things using you know a conversational AI and generative AI? Because these three things together, I call them kind of chatbot 2.0, not uh -huh. the five years ago, 10 years ago, it's a 1.0. So we're in the, in the phase of 2.0 with generative AI coming in. So the experiences can be personalized. It can solve some of the use cases. It is not going to eliminate the entire need for the human. You still need the human because there will be those scenarios where I missed my flight. I need to talk to somebody. I received a broken phone. I need to talk to somebody. Those things will be there. So you still need to enable your employees to do that. So I see the mix of both tech for the agent as well as the digital team should do some level of automation so that they're reducing the repetitive task of wasting agents' time and something that they don't need to spend time on. So that way you're giving keeping the balance on both. Perfect. Thank you for that. So the um so there was two things that, that I wanted to talk to you about. I mean one was about they were uh, the the reports and that's we've done that. And the the next thing is when we were talking and setting up the podcast, you mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to to ask you about. Um, and the, one of the things you, you, you said was that you th thought a, a bot must emulate a company's brand through its characteristics, like from physical traits to accents. And I was a bit like, okay, um, why should we do this? And how are we, and how are we going to make sure that it's aligned and authentic to the, to the brand? Because I thought it's a really interesting kind of thing, because then you get like, we got a thousand and one different sort of like flavors of Siri or Alexa or whatever, I guess. And, um, and that's sort of the implication of it, really, isn't it not? Yeah. I mean, the brands have to create a persona. For example, we look at uh, uh, every customer that I'm talking to are branding their, their chatbot a name. And they don't want to call chatbot anymore. They really call it virtual assistants. Mm -hmm. So that they're, cre they're creating a brand for it. Like, I talked to Amy, right? And, Amy is this virtual assistant that's going to help you with everything you need. And every person that's behind the contact center is also like an Amy, right? So, so you're kind of creating a persona for that. And the way the persona works is you want to create your brand values into it. You know, what does the brand mean? And the bot will have AI, you know, just AI thinking behind it. Let's say you, you automate it completely. Take an example of return, right? I wanted to return. What is my return policy? 
Mm-hmm. If the customer is returning the product on 46th day instead of 45 days, the, the, the rule says 45 days is the return policy. So what is the bandwidth? So, and this is where if you want to create that life, customer lifetime value and create the human experiences, you want to be empathetic to the customer and ask questions on what went wrong on the product and trying to enforce the policy. Like AI bot, stupid bot, right? 45 days, I can't take it. Mm-hmm. So how do I enforce that, you know, the thing that you want to drive from a culture perspective into a bot by building those flexibility so that bots not just acting by some rules without any human into it, which is what, when you talk to a human, you get a human, right? So right. the bots human enough, then it will just follow the rules, it's just like robots, stupid, stupid robot will just follow the rules it gives you. So this is where giving a brand, giving, you know, the, the, the rules of the engagement on how you handle customers and the rules that humans have is the same thing that you need to set in the bot to create the personality, but also give it room that, hey, it's okay to handle the use case I gave you up to 45 days to up to 50 days as an example. We just give them another week. Uh, so that way it's able to handle those use case. And that's what I mean when it when you when you're giving a personality to it is I see how good are you when you come to a customer service? Are you willing to listen to a customer? Are you just enforcing a rule? So that is what I'm calling about giving a persona, not just about how you talk, you know, how you communicate. But it's also about how you handle customers from a brand building perspective. I see. Okay, that makes more sense. So it's not just about kind of like how it sounds. Yeah. It's actually more about how it interacts and the, and the degrees of flexibility and sort of, you know, things and as they respond to the problems. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, and then the other thing that um, I wanted to ask was is around multilingual kind of bots because... Yeah. I know that, you know, I'm not a technologist, but I, I sort of like, I learn a lot about the, um, the, the you know, the, the space by just paying attention to these things. And I know that many of the large language models have got better at multilingual sort of like uh, conversational kind of layers and access to this sort of knowledge. But um, it took a little, a little while and many of the lower resource languages weren't necessarily getting the right sort of results when you were using a large language model and a translation layer on the on the top because it was losing some of the cultural and language kind of nuances and things and so having a multilingual multilingual bot this is going to become more and more vital to you know international kind of brands because people want to be served in their own language but some by a, a piece of technology that understands the language and the culture and the nuances and all these different things i mean is this getting kind of easier kind of like now yeah i think the there are translate tools available so there's multiple ways you do language translate right so the first one is you can use like off the shelf language translate tools if you're doing a chat right so obviously a chat transcript comes to you in whatever the language the website is better and when it comes to an agent i can always do a conversion of that language to the language that the agent is in. So mm-hmm. for example, if the agent is in US, somebody is in Germany, they're trying to talk to you in German, then how do you transcode that and give it to you in English? And the agent responds back in English and then it transcodes back to German. So that is one way, which is where you have a room for error, a lot of room for error because a lot of the semantics and nuances are missed with these yeah. language transcripts, right? So yeah. they're not really like German, right? You know, it's kind of a mix of English translated to German, right? It's, it, the user can understand that this is not really a German company. So, which is where, you know, uh, the biggest problem for people to, you know, being local as well as uh, being global is how do you actually do natively within the language support? So, which is where I need to understand the language and start training within the German language in those bots so that the native training gives you the perfect response as if you feel you're talking to a German user. So our German contact center agent, yeah. right? So German bot. So that is the differences between these two approaches. The third approach is when you're using voice type technology, it actually hears a conversation, almost like an interpreter type thing, right? So when you have an AI interpreter in between, you speak something in, in voice in German, then my bot uses to you, it tells me in English, and I tell you in English, it converts it, and then converts us. It's really cumbersome. Uh, it feels like we have an interpreter, the conversation of two minutes takes 10 minutes. Mm. Yeah, no, it's a bit like the, um, do, do you know the, um, 
the book and the film uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. with the um, the you know the babel fish that got stuck in the the the, um, the ear where um, Arthur was traveling around and they could stick it in his ear and they could speak to everybody and understand everybody. I mean, I think I spoke to somebody that was in language tech and they said that's ultimately what we're what we're aiming for, but we're a long way we're a long long way from it. Okay. Yeah, the models we get there, I mean, the models will understand languages, so they can convert in the local dialects because, again, it gets into dialects of each country. Language is not one, right? So if we have done, for example, we have uh, deployed in uh, in Dubai, and we support Arabic. And we thought, oh, we just support Arabic. We can do it. We can handle it. When you go and deploy it, there are eight different dialects of Arabic. Sure. And they all are different. I mean, all use the same sphere, but they read it differently. They converse differently. So how do you kind of handle those nuances of supporting local dialects within those languages? Yeah. Even in the US, English is, is is global language. You come towards the south where I live in, it's a different accent. And sure. that live in north is a different accent. And the culture is slightly different from one to the other. So understanding all those nuances is very, very critical. Uh, so that is that is what I believe is needed when you have to handle those languages and dialect support. Yeah, no, I think that's that is fair. I mean, I, I used to live in the Middle East, and so I know a little bit of Arabic. I used to live in Cairo, and so anybody who's listening in, in that understands Arabic, they'll know that there was there's two different types of Arabic in in, in Egypt. There's Fosha, which is your classical written Arabic. There's the stuff that you would see in the Quran or or written in the, in the newspapers, and then there's Amea. I think I'm, I'm pronouncing that that right. It's a long time since I've said it, but which is there's just the spoken. Arabic. Yeah. And then within that, so you've got those two different types of things and how those things are written, kind of, you know, some people will write in Armea and not write kind of classically because depending on what they're what they're they're writing about. But then how you pronounce things, like there's like in some in in Egypt they will pronounce the, the letter g with a G, but in yeah. the Gulf it will, will be with a J. So it'll be Jim. And yeah. so that, as you say, there's all these differences there, and it's only separated by what geographically might not necessarily. It might sound or seem homogenous, but it's not when you get down to the kind of local level. It's fascinating. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And that's where language and dialects is very important. And I believe there will be small language models that will come that can handle these languages and dialects for those particular people. Yeah, no, I think that's because I I, I I completely agree. And I think the um that's where it's almost I almost call it the um it's one of those last miles of customer experience when you get that sort of like level of when you build those small language models that can then deliver that uh, that level of customization and personalization for those particular kind of markets, that's when you can start to get some to some seriously kind of like improved outcomes. Yeah. But one final thing before we kind of move on to some kind of wrap-up questions, because this, this is something that we also explore on the um, the podcast from time to time. And you said protecting vulnerable customers as the presence of AI in our day-to-day -day, um, life increases. You said that's going to be important. I, and I want wanted you to want to understand what you actually meant by that and how are we going to go about doing that? Because, well, right, yes. Well, all sorts of vulnerabilities exist, and we need to protect kind of people. But I wanted to understand kind of how the tech plays a role in in, in that. Yeah, I mean there are regulations coming when it comes to data protection, as well as uh, uh, you. Both Europe has a legislation. US actually has declared. I mean Biden and Harris got uh, executive order a year ago, and now NAFP published standards on how you actually can deploy your tech. And what can we do? What can we not do? And again, state laws are there in the US, just like in Europe, you know, every every country will have their local regulations on these things. So you as a brand have to say that when a consumer is reaching out to you, that you need to be clearly communicating or talking to a virtual assistant, or you can call it a brand, you're talking to Amy as an example. And when when they ask for a human, you're really routing it to human and the human will come back and talk to them about it. But throughout this process, uh, there is a question that came to us saying, hey, should I actually carry sentiment? Right. Is that, a, is that a revelation? Is that something that the bot should pass it down or not? So these are the things that is work in progress. You know, we, we really don't know how the tech can solve unless the regulations are published saying, 
you can or cannot do certain things in black and white. In US, they published in black and white saying, these are the things you can do, these are the things you cannot do. So where we need to provide you know, on the PI data to be encrypted. Mm -hmm. and, and we're also hearing companies not willing to deploy generative AI if the model is actually hosted by third party. And they're asking us that with their model lives within their four walls, or within their own cloud, private cloud that they manage and cover, which is where the CISO office is more powerful than the CI office these days because of the data concerns, data privacy concerns and securities. With all these data leaks that are coming out in the last, uh, you know, uh, you know, five six years, people are worried about it, and this is where they're trying to go cautiously. So I believe the technology is here to solve those problems, but the regulations have to come out first, and right. these leaks return black and white so that the tech teams can follow the standards. But in US, they've come out recently, so we're following those standards. NIST published the standards. It's a uh, National Institute of Us uh, Tech Tech. You know, uh, standards like the RFC standards uh, mm -hmm. for the you know, NIST published those standards. So we're, we're kind of adhering to those standards when it comes to data production, PI data production. Those laws are in line with dot com companies. It's not like anything drastically different. But Department of Labor will ask you to publish a report on how many people are really letting go because of AI. Okay. So that kind of watching these things so that AI is kind of helping people, not hurting, hurting people. And the brands are not looking to fire people. When I talk to brands, they're talking about, hey, this is not about a cost-cutting measure. This is about repurposing my people to do more productive things to increase my top level. Yeah. So and they, some of the contact centers that used to do, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, money transfer type use cases or credit card, uh, you know, lost use cases. Those use cases are automated. Now those guys are becoming what we call as uh, asset, uh, you know, uh, 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 managers where they're going and talking to customers from a, a wealth management perspective uh, within the assets, they're looking at multiple assets. And now they started selling things and doing better things in life as well. So that way, the repetitive things are given to the bar and more important things that are driving top line are driving. So that's the one regulation that we're, we're closely looking at, the enterprise are looking at. So they, they will be, look, the government will be looking at these things very closely. But from a PII tech tech perspective, you know, doing a TLS 1.3 or data production, data in transit, motion, rest, all of that will be encrypted. And we will not be collecting PI data. We'll be masking those in the voice calls. And if the regulation comes saying you cannot use sentiment, we can actually kill the sentiment there with the bar. And when the call comes back to the agent, then the agent can continue the conversation. Okay. Perfect. But it's definitely kind of a watch this space and keep a keep an eye on it because it's it's a um it's not yet to be. It's not yet being solved. That's right. It's it's working progress. That's what they call it. In yeah. some places we found it. In some places we are uh, yet to be solved. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So, um, Gopi, the thank you for that. I mean, is there anything else that, that that you wanted to highlight or add that we've missed out before I ask you some quick fire final questions? No, I think we've covered the comprehensively on both the agent side and the customer experience side. Awesome. Now, now let's get into it. The, kind of, I got three quick fire questions for you. So the first one is we've talked about a whole bunch of things. So I always ask people to try and boil it down. And what I do is ask them to complete this kind of like sentence. And the sentence is this. If you want to improve your customer or employee experience, Gopi says, do this, dot, dot, dot. Over to you. Complete that sentence. Yeah. So I think the, the big thing is companies are worried about the tech. The tech problems are simpler ones, right? You can always solve it. I think I want every brand to go and try and do a pilot of a small use case that has least exposure. It could be an employee experience. You don't want to go and try it in customer experience, but you can try it in an employee experience. How can I improve my help desk problems in IT help desk? Or how can I improve my problems in HR help desk where I'm helping my employees? So you can always go internal first and validate all the tech and then start doing pilots into the CX side and then slowly expand. So instead of making this macro jump that AI is going to solve all my problems in one year, it doesn't. It's a journey. Mm -hmm. So the journey takes three to five years. We have worked with the big brands, started our journey in 2018 using conversation AI. Now we're getting to the stage where we're trying to deploy generative AI because you need data to get ready for generative AI. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not for using a model and putting in the print and uh, creating a chatbot using OpenAI or any of these models out there. And there are risks involved in it. So that is why going cautiously, creating a longer term three to five year journey 
of AI, transitioning this into the ideal state that you're looking at, and start playing with those things now from a pilot perspective. Uh, talk to vendors like Core, and that can actually help them do a pilot. Uh, get small, learn, learn quickly, and then iterate faster, then slowly scale those things into one or two departments, get the outcomes that you want to get, whether it's CSAT improvement, whether this is uh, call handling time satisfaction or employee satisfaction when it comes to agents. So do some of these things in some departments and then expand it massively in the next two to three years. So that's the kind of advice I would give anyone that's looking for transformation. Perfect. That's great advice. So the second one is that is a punk related one. This is the Punk CX podcast after all. I wrote a couple of books that were punk themed about the whole experience sort of space. And so what I wanted to ask you was, so what company or brand do you think is taking a more of a punk approach to customer experience or, or is maybe like an experience leader, one that's got it all stitched together. They're leading the field. The one that you go, I always like them. They're always, they always seem to be doing the right thing or great things. Who would you hold up there? Now, I, mean, I would put the best brands that, you know, JV Fowers are rating now. There are companies that rate people for their experiences. So I would go from my personal experiences. Uh, digital natives are the first ones that adopt the tech, right? So I don't want to give any one brand. I'll give you, I mean, most of you know, like Amazon's of the world, you know, Netflix of the world. Uh, they've adopted the tech much faster. So they are actually the brands that are actually driving customer service because they are metric driven at the same time they're driving uh, you know, they're plowing the road for us, they're in, investing in this tech and developing the tech as well to get us there. So I believe those are the brands that we need to look at that are more close to tech, but at the same time, they have metrics that they're hitting, which is the metrics that you're all looking to hit when it comes to the CSATs for, say, using tech is not, doesn't mean my CSAT's going to suck, you know, it's going to suck. Yeah. It's all about how do you do it in a pragmatic approach and have the vision and then continue to do those things he is more important thing. So I would give you, if I had to pick a brand, I'll pick Amazon as a brand because, you know, you can see uh, how they created a brand globally. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so final question. And I, I've been, re- I've been asking this question increasingly on the podcast over the last kind of like, uh, well, the last year, I guess. And the question is really about, can we end on a good news story? Because the world's a bit odd, to say the least. And every morning, it's hard to get away from troubling headlines, shall we say. So what I've been asking people to do at the end of these podcasts is to give me a good news story. And so tell me, Gopi, something that you've seen, say, in the last week or so that you've gone, that's great. That just made me smile. It warmed my heart. It was just like, it was a, it was a great thing. So what have you seen? What have you heard? Go. So the last week I heard, uh, I, I actually played with Croc, the new model that, uh, that, uh, Musk, Elon Musk's company has announced. And the model is so good. And the, the biggest problem is the inference delay in the LLM space, which is when you ask a question, it takes a lot of time to compose an answer. Uh, that model is actually sub second level latencies in providing answers. So. It's a matter of you typing the answer is there, return to you, and just you know giving you the answer. So wow. what, why I care about this is using this, you can actually go deploy generative AI in voice use cases. Because the problem with generative AI is when you're calling a voice call, you cannot wait for the response to come because you're you're, you're giving full conscious, right? So your three or four senses are on the call, right? Unlike just on chat, right? So. Hmm. And the response in the responsiveness of this this model is so good. Being a large language model, I believe this is going to transform how the voice business is done when it comes to asking questions. So I'm waiting eagerly, waiting for them to allow me to customize and fine tune those models to create my own model with my data. Mm-hmm. So once that is done, and I believe the tech is going where voice automation is also very close with generative AI. Wow. Not a, not a floor to it. It's generative AI. Driven. So all you need to know is here are the blanks you need to fill, go have an open conversation with the customer. Cool. Nice. Well, Gopi, that's all I have for today. And I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much uh, for your sharing your time and your expertise and your insight with me. But also congratulations for Core AI being top right on many of these um, analyst reports, that's, you know, that's some achievement. But, you know, just 
thank you for um, being my guest on the podcast today. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Wow, what a great interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Find out more about me and the work that I do at adriansfrinsko.com. Do leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any comments, feedback, or questions about the podcast, then feel free to send me a message to podcast at adrianswinsco.com. And do tune in again. Thanks very much.